Now, one of the most respected scientists who was also a spiritualist was uh, this gentleman here who's sort of doing some exercise uh, in, his, in his home, uh, Sir Oliver Lodge, um, who very much uh, pursued both electro electromagnetic research and study of spirits and telepathy as two sides of the same coin. Um, he's today famous for being one of the pioneers of radio, as well as inventing the spark plug and uh, the loudspeaker. Um, so he invented a device called the Coherer, which was like a simple electromagnetic wave detector. Uh, and uh, he spent much of his later career sort of uh, competing with Marconi um, in commercializing uh, the radio. And he was also an active member of the, the SPR. But he was very respected. He, he gave a lot of public lectures, and he was seen as this very, very reliable scientific figure. So um, when Frederick Myers, the, one of the founders of SPR that we, we met earlier, uh, decided to do an experiment as he sort of felt his end of his life was approaching, uh, he gave uh, a Lodge a sealed letter uh, that was only to be opened after, after Myers' death. And he was going to try to pass on a message from beyond that, that was supposed to be matched to, to the contents of the letter. And um, it seemed like the experiment was successful. So in 1901, a group of women at the very highest level of British society started receiving messages from Myers uh, via automated writing. And, and at least according to some interpretations, the messages matched the contents of the letter that Lodge had been given. So, so one of the um, um, kind of key mediums where, some of the key mediums were Alice Fleming up, up on the left, uh, who was the uh, sister, of, sister of the famous writer Rudyard Kipling. Uh, and uh, Alice also co-authored some of uh, Kipling's early Indian tales. Um, as a side note, Kipling also wrote a great little short story called The Wireless, which is about contacting the afterlife with radio. Um, another uh, medium receiving messages from, uh, from Myers was uh, Winifred Coombe Tennant up there on, on the right, also a very remarkable woman, a suffragist, a member of parliament, and later the uh, British delegate to the League of Nations. But there were a few, few others, others as well. And um, they, all, the, all the letters from Myers were uh, shared amongst this very, very elite group. And the hub of the group was the sort of moustached gentleman uh, on the bottom, bottom left, uh, Arthur Balfour, who uh, had been the president of the SPR. And at the time when these letters were arriving, he was the prime minister of Britain. Um, and uh, later he got the nickname Bloody Balfour for sort of cruelly putting down unrest in Northern Ireland. And he was actually the one who signed the uh, declara British Declaration to uh, found the, the state of Palestine. So a pretty important guy. Uh, his brother Gerald in the middle, middle was sort of equally accomplished. And uh, they had a third brother, Francis, who died very young at the age of 30 uh, many years uh, before while climbing Mont Blanc. And he, he was known as, uh, for, for, his, for his talent in biology. And people were saying that he would be the successor to Darwin. But he, he died before he could uh, realize that. But in any case, this group circulated all these uh, letters arriving from Frederick Myers from beyond, from the afterlife, via automated writing. And um, it was kind of a sh shared hypertext, if you like. They kept all this very secret. Um, and these letters were all interconnected, seemingly, even though different people received them. There were symbols that recurred from classics, from the Bible, from Shakespeare, and so, so on. And there were so many interconnections that ultimately the group became entirely convinced that this was real. This was Myers talking to them from the afterlife. Other people started talking to them from the afterlife, including uh, Jane Littleton, who'd been sort of this lost love of Arthur Balfour when he was young, who uh, also died very young, uh, and also Francis Balfour, uh, the, the, uh, the sort of third Balfour brother. And uh, there was a, this big picture, this, this plan or a story that started to emerge from the letters. And um, so, so what Myers was, was saying uh, was that a kind of Darwinian evolution continued in the afterlife. And, and as Myers and, uh, and Francis Balfour had entered the afterlife, they had gotten a lot smarter. Um, and there had been a sort of scientific revolution in the afterlife. Uh, people in the afterlife had perfected the engineering of souls. And in fact, Francis Balfour was leading a team of spirit scientists who were designing a perfect soul, uh, a sort of perfectly engineered spirit child whose task would be to deliver humanity from chaos. And, uh, and of course, this perfect soul only needed a vessel to be incarnated into. Now, again, a bit of context. This was 1912 at this point. And the British elite had this uh, kind of widespread sense of crisis approaching, chaos in the world. There were socialists and anarchists and feminists and suffragists and sort of, sort of unrest in Europe and all these alliances unraveling. Uh, so it was pretty clear that somebody, 
somebody needed to, to save the world. Um, so two members of this group, uh, so Arthur's living brother Gerald in the middle and uh, Winifred uh, up on the right, sort of took one for the team and they, they had an affair. Although they, were, they were instructed by, by the spirits to have an affair. Uh, and Winifred's much older husband actually knew about it, but, uh, but sort of maintained stiff upper, upper lip and, and said nothing about it. And um, so Winifred got pregnant and gave, the birth, gave birth to the vessel of this perfect engineered soul. Um, and I just can't help thinking how, how remarkable this story is, story is. I mean, this is happening, happening at the sort of highest levels of, of British politics and society, uh, combining all these, these ideas about eugenics and evolution and engineering applied in this very otherworldly context. So, uh, here is the spirit child um, at the age of one and then at the age of, uh, uh, of 30. And uh, he was called Henry Coombe Tennant, uh, born in 1913. And as far as we know, he wasn't the Messiah. He, he didn't save the world from, from chaos, unfortunately. Um, but he did have a pretty interesting life. Um, he studied in Cambridge. He, he met um, uh, Wittgenstein, was taught by Ludwig Wittgenstein, the famous philosopher, uh, fought in World War II and uh, got imprisoned, uh, escaped a German prison camp by himself, fled across Europe, uh, ended up working for uh, the British Intelligence Service for MI6, together with Kim Philby, who, who would uh, later be revealed as uh, one of the most... Uh, uh, one of the deepest Soviet moles, uh, double agents of, of all time. And it was really Henry's life that kind of made me, made me decide that uh, uh, Summerland had to, be, had to be a spy story, and he was an inspiration for one of the protagonists. Um, now, later on, Henry's life sort of quieted down, um, uh, and, but in the 50s, he did try to contact his mother, Winifred, through... through uh, through, through, uh, through a medium, probably to complain about, about uh, the kind of weird circumstances of his birth or, or too high expectations. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, it's not clear if he succeeded, but soon after that he did go away to become a Catholic monk and lived for, for the rest of his life in solitude. So uh, it is actually the kind of biography you can never put in fiction because nobody would, nobody would believe it. 